This is the third installment in this series discussing the link between Bitcoin and ecology. In the first two videos, we tried to explain why Bitcoin is not necessarily as bad for the environment as some people claim. The ecological trial of Bitcoin is often done by people who do not understand the technology at all. They see Bitcoin as, at best, an extremely inefficient solution compared to the current banking system. Critics often compare, for example, the 60,000 transactions per second of the Visa network to the seven small transactions that Bitcoin can handle, and naturally conclude that Satoshi Nakamoto's invention is clearly not worth spending so much energy on. Unfortunately, this reasoning is completely wrong. Well, at the same time, I can't blame them. Most people don't understand at all how the current banking system works, including marketplaces, central banks, commercial banks, payment networks, money, reserves, the repo market, or clearing houses. When you make a payment in a restaurant or on the internet with your credit card, the money does not travel instantly to the recipient. There are an average of 17 intermediaries that revolve around the various bank payment methods. The current financial system has been developed in successive layers to progressively make exchanges more fluid. It is an extremely complex system, and despite what many people think, gold is still the backbone of this whole structure. It is true that our currencies have not been linked to gold for a relatively long time, and that we have abused the credit system enormously in the last decades, but gold is still the reserve of value par excellence. If you want to be convinced of this, look at what the central banks are accumulating. Afterwards, in this period of great upheaval, everyone is lying about their own reserves. The Chinese and the Russians certainly have a lot more, while we suspect the US has a lot less. That being said, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, from 1987 to 2006 said, Gold still represents the ultimate form of payment in the world. Fiat money in extremis is accepted by nobody. Gold is always accepted. If you still don't believe me, find out more about the Federal Bank of New York's gold reserves which are buried 25 meters underground on Manhattan Island, and who transfers gold bars from one vault to another thanks to an automated winch system according to demands of the different central and commercial banks around the world. This is what Bitcoin can eventually be compared to. Satoshi's invention attempts to offer a version 2.0 of physical gold and to be the base layer of a new financial and monetary system. Mankind has never seen nor had such an efficient and effective monetary technology. Again. Bitcoin is not a simple payment network like Cash App or PayPal. Satoshi Nakamoto's invention is much more complex. As Yves Chouefete puts so well, gold is just Bitcoin in a lesser form. Now, you should know that Bitcoin is growing, and successive layers are emerging to allow for increased network performance, without compromising the decentralization and security of the basic structure. I'm referring, of course, to the Lightning Network, which already allows payments to be made at the speed of light at almost no cost, and all this is possible thanks to Bitcoin's primary layer. If you are interested in this topic, I highly recommend the book Layered Money by Nick Bhatia, which explains very well the evolution of the monetary and financial system since the 15th century and reflects on the different possible scenarios combining Bitcoins and MNBCs. But back to the topic of this video. Today we would like to discuss the environmental toxicity of the current monetary and financial system and how a return to a sound and sustainable currency such as Bitcoin, for example, could benefit the ecological cause. Come on, let's go. The universal objective of central banks, price stability. So why are they all aiming for about 2% inflation per year or a doubling of prices every 35 years? Well, what the world's central banks fear most of all is deflation, the structural fall in prices. It is seen as a real threat to be avoided at all costs. One could even be more precise. What all central banks fear in the end is the so-called Fisher deflationary crisis. Basically, a drop in prices leads to a drop in income, which leads to a drop in investment, which leads to a rise in unemployment and a rise in business failures, which eventually kills the banking system and everyone dies in agony. That's pretty much what happened in the 1930s. But to say this is to forget two crucial things. First, capitalism is by nature deflationary. Its objective is simple, to produce more and better with the same or often less means. And the second thing is that studying a deflationary economic system from the point of view of the Fisher spiral is like studying the social organization of the family in general, taking as a starting point dysfunctional families where daddy hits mommy. Basically. The reason governments don't like deflation is because of the false values and false prices that haunt our Western economies. 
Fake debt, administered interest rates, and structural deficits do not allow an economy to function in the long run. Put another way, when you live beyond your means by spending more than you earn for decades, touching the monetary system is not a very good idea. As we explained in the video, it is not the monetary system itself that is the problem. It could work if the rules were respected, and especially if all economic players understood these rules. But unfortunately, this system is totally corrupted, and it will be extremely difficult to tell the Chinese, for example, that they will never see their foreign exchange reserves accumulated in the West by a generation of workers who have literally worked themselves to death. And the same is true for American and European savers who have put aside savings for a retirement that will probably never be paid out in full. We have therefore been in a headlong rush for several decades, in a total illusion that tries to make people believe that the international monetary system is still operational despite the reality. It is actually quite funny to hear that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme when it is precisely the current system that requires more and more debts to pay the former creditors. As Henry Ford said at the beginning of the 20th century, it is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Some people will say that we are glad that the state intervened and that the central banks created money during the crisis of the anti-COVID measures. Yes, indeed. Punctual and precise help from the government to prevent the economy from plunging into a deep crisis can be beneficial. And again, we could argue about it considering that we haven't really experienced the side effects of all these aids yet. But let's consider for this video that punctual and precise help from the government was necessary. On the other hand, constantly preventing the bankruptcy of zombie companies is extremely toxic. And by zombie companies, I mean those companies whose revenues are no longer sufficient to pay the interest on their debt. The natural process of cleaning up the market is necessary. If a company is not performing well, is not profitable, and or is not satisfying its customers, it must disappear and make room for another entity that will eventually be more efficient and better able to meet the needs of the market. You're probably wondering what all this has to do with ecology. Well, in my opinion, the current system of debt money, that is, the magic money system, where access to credit is relatively easy with interest rates manipulated by central banks and where commercial banks though they will never jump, leads to a disastrous risk management, misallocation of capital, and a phenomenal waste of resources. The current system is sorely lacking in skin in the game, as Nassim Taleb would say. And the same could be said of our governments, which have no budget limits. Our leaders are completely disconnected from reality. As Charles Gave says, it's a bit like leaving the keys to the cellar to an alcoholic sommelier. At a time when we are trying to reduce our impact on the environment as much as possible, these monetary issues are, in my humble opinion, essential. In my opinion, the financial and monetary system is sick and is fundamentally incompatible with the ecological objectives we have set for ourselves. The debt inflation growth model is untenable. So what do we do? Well, we could try a 180 degree turn. Bitcoin could, in my opinion, help us start a new cycle. Today, the powerful in place are witnessing the arrival of Bitcoin without really appreciating its impact on the system. If the monetary power escapes for a while, and even partially from our leaders, it is the whole system that is forced to evolve. If Bitcoin becomes the standard of value that more and more of us are referring to in order to escape today's fake currencies, then Satoshi Nakamoto's invention may be the first domino to fall, forcing an overhaul of the system. And this is what is needed to bring about an ecological revolution. We need to notice the false values in market prices to identify the debts that will never be paid, to give back the real value to currencies through free exchange rates, but also to put interest rates back to their rightful price in order to give a price to risk and to the future. It is urgent to break down the illusions that prevent us from moving forward and innovating. To find the new behaviors and technologies that will allow us to adapt to fossil fuel depletion and global warming, we must face reality and be forced to find solutions to these problems. A rare and limited currency like Bitcoin could finally push us to reshuffle the cards. In this, Bitcoin is a valuable tool to restart a cycle of creative destruction. It is a lifeboat, an alternative for those who no longer want to participate in the system as it is today. Bitcoin can be a tool that allows people to vote with their feet. It is by deserting these systems where the value is false that they could fall out on their own. Bitcoin makes sense as a way to escape from government currencies but it is also the whole movement of decentralized finance that can allow people to escape from traditional banks and financial markets. Satoshi Nakamoto's invention could completely upend the global economic model and fundamentally change our mindsets. This must be kept in mind when evaluating the value of Bitcoin and its potential impact on the environment. We are not talking about a new Visa or PayPal. It is much deeper than that. 
it's a system change. This new model based on a limited quantity of money could perhaps, and at least for a while, make us move from forced mass consumption to a thoughtful consumption of quality. Indeed, when your savings take value over time, unlike today, you think twice before buying the new trendy t-shirt or the iPhone 25. Yes, the transition will most likely be complicated and painful. There is no doubt about that in my opinion. But we can try to make this paradigm shift as smooth as possible. To use the analogy of the heroin addict, the idea is to wean the patient off the drug gradually without killing him. This detoxification treatment seems to me to be necessary and urgent in order to envisage the future more serenely. That was for the optimists. Now, be careful not to fall into the same traps. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing right now with people not holding their private keys, for example, or with the arrival of an ETF on the future Bitcoin contracts. Let's be clear, this new financial product is the first paper Bitcoin. Are we doomed to repeat the same mistakes forever? When the big banks and the other investment funds will own a large part of Bitcoins, won't we fall back into the same mistakes of fractional reserve and false value? Isn't Bitcoin ultimately just a transfer of wealth from one ruling dominant caste to another? Bitcoin is an anarchist construct where the community of users is supposed to have the power. But it was also kind of the promise of the internet in the beginning, until GAFA came along. Open source systems like Linux are still very much in place, but still almost everyone uses private companies because it's simpler and easier. It is true that for centuries the corruption of tools has been part of the logic of power. It's a bit cynical, but it seems to be in our nature. I think it's important to keep all this in mind and not to be naive about it. But in any case, the technology is there. It's there and it pushes us to make choices. Now the question is to know if we will know how to use this emancipating force correctly. On that note, see you soon for new videos.